Now we're going to talk about Middle Byzantine monastery churches and the mosaics that decorate them. With Middle Byzantine architecture, the monastery churches are uh, what we look to to determine the type of architecture. And they generally are centralized churches. Uh, very frequently they have either a Greek cross plan, that is a cross that is uh, uh, equal arms both ways, or uh, what they call a cross in the square. In other words, you have a Greek cross uh, with the, the corners filled in. Uh, and so you'll have a central dome uh, at the crossing, at the center, and then either vaults or domes in the corners or in the cross arms. So we're going to look at uh, some examples of this. And the first one is a church in Greece. Remember that Greece is part of, or Greece was part of the Byzantine Empire. And this is Hoseus Lucas in Phocis in Greece. Uh, and this church dates from the 11th century. It actually is uh, two connected churches at this monastery. Uh, one is called the Catholicon, and this is a Greek cross plan, and the other is dedicated to the Theotokos, uh, to uh, Mary as God-bearer. And uh, it has the cross in the square. So both of those types are represented. What we want to do also is look at the mosaics. And so here we are in the church, and we're looking up at the dome. And you can see where some of these mosaics are placed. Uh, in the conch of the apse, in the half dome over the apse, uh, with the altar below, uh, you see a seated Madonna. Uh, you will also see in the center of the central dome, uh, Christ Pantocrator. And that is something that is a very, very frequent uh, uh, subject. It's almost always placed in the center, uh, central highest dome. The mosaics of the Middle Byzantine churches are placed in a hierarchy with the most important images in the highest part of the church, the central dome. And there you will find the image of Christ Pantocrator, Christ the All-Ruler. Also, uh, many of these scenes are in liturgical order, uh, the order of the liturgical year. In other words, the feast days, the holy, hol holy days, from whence we get our word holiday, uh, the 12 feast days uh, of the events in Christ's life. And so it's often said that this is as though you are taking a pilgrimage through the life of Christ or through the Holy Land following, following the liturgical calendar. So a person could go around the church looking at these scenes, praying in front of them, and essentially me making a kind of spiritual pilgrimage through the life of Christ. And because it's a centralized church, you know, it's, it's a, a circular uh, uh, journey. Yeah, you can come back and start it over again. Um, I have here a list of these feast days, if you're interested. Uh, the Annunciation, the Nativity of Christ, the Presentation in the Temple, the baptism of Christ, the transfiguration, the raising of Lazarus, Christ's entry into Jerusalem, his crucifixion, and the resurrection, which would be shown as an anastasis, which means resurrection, uh, as a heroine of hell or a descent into limbo. And then there would be the Pentecost or uh, the um, descent of the Holy Spirit to the apostles and the ascension, Christ ascending into heaven. And either the dormition of the Virgin, which is the death of the Virgin, the going to sleep of the Virgin, uh, or sometimes the nativity of the Virgin. Now in the pendentives, you might sometimes see angels who are spiritual beings, uh, who are high on the hierarchy of being, but what we're going to look at are pendentives that show the four theophanies. And this is Christ revealing himself, revealing himself as God. And you'll find these four theophanies in the, the churches that we're going to use as our examples, Hoseus Lucas and uh, the church at Daphne, which is the church of the Dormition of the Virgin at Daphne. 
um, the Annunciation, which you'll remember is the moment of the incarnation uh, when God, Christ, takes on human flesh. The Nativity of Christ and the Baptism of Christ and the Transfiguration, which we've already heard about when Christ appears between the two great prophets, Moses and Elijah. Otto Demas, in his book on Byzantine mosaics, said that there were three systems of interpretation for the cross and square church, for the arrangement of the mosaics and the cross and square church. Now, these are not uh, exclusive. These work together. You can do all of these things in the church. One is hierarchical, the idea that the church is the cosmos and is an image of paradise. So something that is spiritually higher will be higher in the church for the image of Christ on uh, the central dome. I mentioned that. Or topographic, in which you can make a symbolic or a spiritual pilgrimage through Christ's life or through the Holy Lands uh, by following the images on the wall or the ceilings. And then, of course, you can also follow the liturgical order of the scenes throughout the church. In other words, the date of the feast days. Now, the feast days are not necessarily in chronological order, uh, in the order that they happened in history. So, uh, you know, the nativity is not necessarily followed by the uh, presentation in the calendar year. So this becomes a liturgical order. But uh, they all work together. Let's look again at Hoseas Lucas. Uh, we look up to the, the central dome and we see Christ's Pantocrator. Uh, and you can see that there are angels uh, surrounding him. And then we look at the conch of the apse or the half dome over the altar. We see the image of the virgin and child enthroned, Mary as Theodicus, the God-bearer. And you may notice that the iconography is very, very similar to that famous image over the, the half dome in the conch of the apse at Hagia Sophia. And you'll remember I said that Byzantine art uh, wants to be the true image. So um, there are types. Uh, for showing Mary. You can't just make up what Mary looks like. You have to follow the correct types. And of course, there are variations. Uh, in this case, you know, the, there are, uh, you could compare these and you could see, for example, the length of the face looks a bit different. Uh, this is more stylized and more simplified than the image at Hagia Sophia. Uh, Christ is in a slightly different position. But essentially, you have your frontal image of Mary. Uh, she, her body encloses the Christ child. Uh, and he's shown in this beautiful uh, gold against her rich blue robes. And they are enthroned on uh, the, the Byzantine type throne with uh, what's called a poofy pillow, which you can see uh, there. Let's look at some of the other images uh, in Hoseas Lucas. This is in the crucifixion. It's further down in the apse, but it's still high on the wall. Now I'm going to show you just a few other images from Hoseas Lucas because these are the ones I have pictures of. Now we're going to look at just a few more of the mosaics at Hoseas Lucas. Uh, this is the crucifixion. As you can see, it is in uh, a lunette, uh, fairly high on the wall. Uh, this would be uh, a very important event for Christians. And you can see Christ is stylized. He is uh, nailed to the cross. And it's a different type than we've seen before. We've seen images of Christ um, where he is erect on the cross, where he is alive, where he is triumphant over death. And this is a new type of image. Uh, when we look at uh, when we look at Carolingian art, I'm going to show you the first known example of the suffering of Christ, which is in the 9th century. Uh, but here we see in the 11th century uh, the type of Christ which shows Christ suffering on the cross. He is man as well as God, and he suffers like a man. Uh, so his head is uh, 
inclined, it's sagging down. His body uh, curves to the side as though he were, uh, once again, um, you know, uh, sagging. Um, and it's all done with um, very linear outlines. As you can see, uh, the musculature of the abdomen uh, looks segmented. Uh, it's uh, not very realistic. Uh, it's a pattern. Uh, Mary stands on one side. She points to him. Now she's still Hojitiera pointing to the way. The way to salvation is Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Uh, and on the other side we see John uh, with his hand to his head in the gesture of distress. Uh, but you can see that they are very linear figures. And it's taken, in a sense, out of time because you have the gold background, you don't have all of the narrative details, uh, the other holy women, Mary Magdalene, uh, the soldiers dicing, uh, the, uh, the, the soldiers uh, uh, piercing Christ's side, as Longinus is supposed to have done, or offering him the wine. Just the three main figures. So this becomes an iconic or devotional image uh, rather than a narrative of all the events that happened. Uh, something that you can pray to, that you can meditate on. And you can also see an anastasis or resurrection at Hoseus Lucas. Now, we've already seen the anastasis at the Karyajami, uh, the Church of Christ in Korah. And that one was a fresco, and it was much larger and more elaborate. So what we're seeing at Hoseus Lucas is uh, an abbreviated anastasis uh, with, once again, sort of the main uh, parts of the image. So you see Christ in the center, striding across the opening of hell, uh, and you can see the doors of hell that have burst apart beneath his feet. And then you have what seem to be sarcophagi uh, on either side. In one side stands uh, David and Solomon. And in a sense, they are representing all of the Old Testament figures that we uh, know that Christ rescues, if, if you believe the, uh, uh, the teachings of the church. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, you have uh, Adam and Eve. So uh, you just have four figures standing in for all the prophets and patriarchs and just of the Old Testament rather than having a crowd, as we do at uh, the Kiriyajami. We're now going to look at the Church of the Domitian of the Virgin uh, in Daphne, Greece. Sometimes when we're talking about these churches, uh, we'll refer to them by the city. You know, we'll say, hey, oh, we're looking at Daphne. Uh, we're looking at the famous church at Daphne. Uh, this one's dedicated to the Domitian of the Virgin. Um, Domitian literally would mean going to sleep. Um, and it's kind of a euphemism for the death of the Virgin. And that is um, often portrayed with um, Mary lying on her deathbed with Christ who has come down from heaven uh, holding uh, a small image of Mary, which is her soul, which is you know, taking up to heaven. And the apostles are surrounding uh, the deathbed of the Virgin. When we look at the interior, and you can see here we have the plan, and we have a list of all of these different scenes of the mosaics that still exist. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a good interior uh, picture to show you. But we'll be, we do have pictures of some of the mosaics. Uh, so you can see how they are arranged. So we look up into the dome. And this, of course, is the central dome. Uh, the highest part. It represents heaven. It represents the cosmos. And of course, the ruler of the cosmos is in the center. And this is Christ as Pantocrator. Um, you might notice when you look at this that parts of the mosaic, large parts of the mosaics, um, are uh, gone. They have not managed to survive the centuries. Uh, but we have most of the image of Christ and most of the images that are in the uh, pendentives. Let's look closer at the image of Christ Pantocrator. Iconographically, 
it's the same general type as other images that you've seen. Uh, for example, back to the icon from about 700 on, uh, at the monastery of St. Catherine, where you have Christ with these uh, high cheekbones, uh, large eyes, uh, blessing and holding a book. But stylistically, and I think we could say emotionally, uh, how different he looks. Uh, this is done in mosaic, and so what you're seeing, of course, is um, very stylized. Uh, you have rows of the tesserae that make lines, so it's become very, very linear uh, and very stylized. And just look at the way he's created. Um, would you want to meet this Christ at the Last Judgment? He looks very stern, uh, unforgiving perhaps. He is shown as eternal and timeless. And so he is, uh, you have the bust of Christ in the circle of the Golden Dome of Heaven. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Uh, he is eternal. Um, you know, he's, he, he seems to be more divine than human, even though he is in human flesh, in the human form. Uh, he's holding the Gospels, which of course is this uh, great thick book with the jeweled cross on the front, and is extremely linear. When you look at the drapery folds, uh, you see them as parallel lines falling into sharp angles. And so you have this feeling of a kind of otherworldly abstraction, as though he lives in this immaterial realm of, the, the, uh, of heaven, which is represented, of course, by the golden uh, mosaic in the dome. And he is indeed an omnipotent ruler and an omnipotent judge. In the pendentives, uh, we see scenes from the uh, theophanies of Christ, when Christ is revealed to mankind. Um, the first, of course, is the incarnation itself, uh, the Annunciation. Uh, and then, uh, when we actually see him in human flesh, would be the Nativity. We're looking at the Annunciation, and once again, you have just the two figures. Uh, you don't have um, a naturalistic setting, for example. It seems to be taking place in a timeless realm. Uh, we said these are in the pendentives, uh, the next highest place below the dome. We see the theophanies of Christ, the times when Christ revealed himself to mankind. Um, the first one, of course, is the incarnation, when Christ first takes on human flesh, uh, also known as uh, uh, the first, of course, is the uh, incarnation, when Christ takes on human flesh. Uh, the second is the nativity, when he is born, and uh, human beings can actually see him uh, in, in, in the flesh. So let's take a look at each of these images. We're looking at the Annunciation. This is the moment when the angel Gabriel tells Mary, announces, hence Annunciation, uh, tells Mary that she is going to bear the Christ child. And it is at the time of the Annunciation when Mary gives her permission, when Mary says, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, that the Holy Spirit overshadows her and she becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And that is the moment of the Incarnation, the moment when Christ takes on human flesh. Now, I want you to notice a few things about this image. Um, the way, of course, that the Byzantines show angels with these uh, wonderful uh, wings that come up in a, a kind of uh, circular motion that encloses and repeats uh, the, the uh, halo above the uh, head of the angel. Um, but they're very simplified images. Uh, we don't have a setting. We don't uh, see the room in which Mary is, uh, is having this event. So once again, it's taking place in, as a kind of timeless event, um, rather than just one point in history. And you can see, of course, how linear the forms are, how the draperies uh, form angles and curves that relate back to when these, um, you, you had 
illusionistic images. But if you think copying illusionistic images and copying and, and they become more linear and more stylized. And uh, so then you have this very stylized uh, style of art, uh, much more abstracted, which is often suggested that more abstract art refers to the spiritual realm because it does not exactly repeat uh, the material world around us. Now, one thing you have to realize when you're looking at these, we said these are on pendentives. You look at a photograph and they look flat, but use your imagination. This is curving, like in the conch of an apse. Only here, uh, a slighter curve, but still the curve of the pendentives. So, the angel Gabriel is really placed across space from Mary. He really is communicating to her across the space rather than in a completely flat image. But the, the flatness is how each image is portrayed and yet they exist uh, in, in an actual space. Now we're looking at the nativity, uh, the birth of Christ. And this has many more narrative elements in it. Uh, when you look at different uh, examples of the nativity at different uh, churches, they all, once again, share common iconographic elements. Uh, sometimes, you know, there's slight differences, but uh, some of these things you will see over and over again. Um, Mary is shown reclining after the birth. Uh, she always seems to be on this great Poofy, I, I, I want to call it an air mattress. I'm sure that's not what it is, but this, uh, this great uh, poofy bed uh, or mattress. And the Christ child is in the manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. You might notice the little heads of the ox and the ass. There's several ways of showing the ox and the ass, and this probably refers to a legend uh, that the ox and the ass warmed the Christ child with their breath. Uh, Joseph is uh, seated at the side uh, with his you know, hand up to his chin and sort of contemplating everything. Uh, Joseph, of course, according to Christian doctrine, was not the actual father of Christ. He's the foster father, uh, so he's sort of uh, set aside. Um, and uh, this has a little bit of narrative detail that you do not see in all of the nativities. For example, it has this little sheep uh, drinking water. Uh, they just may be the shepherd's sheep drinking water and you had to fill in the corner. Uh, they do happen to remind me of the stags drinking the living water. Uh, we see everything is taking place uh, on this little, this little hill or mountain. Uh, the, the nativity is taking place in a cave. Uh, and if you were to go to Jerusalem, uh, and find the site that St. Helena had identified as the place of the nativity. It is the grotto of the nativity. It is a cave. Uh, and uh, so this is why you would see a cave rather than a stable uh, in Byzantine art. Uh, we see that Christ child and Mary, the Holy Family, are accompanied by angels. And then there is another angel who uh, turns toward two shepherds. And of course, uh, this is the Annunciation to the shepherds. And uh, they are being told to go and visit the newborn Savior. And here we have a little uh, close-up. Uh, so you can see Christ and Mary. And uh, in this particular picture, it gives you a little idea of the shimmering of the gold. Remember, all of these images are light, and light will reflect off of the golden and glass tesserae. And so it, it would seem to shimmer and um, have a certain amount of movement, uh, maybe a, a sort of heavenly feel to it. Uh, we're seeing here the baptism of Christ. Uh, you've seen baptisms before, so you recognize many of these elements. Uh, think about the Menologian of Basil the uh, second that you saw. Or was that Basil the first? <laughs> okay. Uh, think about the Menologium of Basil that you saw and the uh, mosaics in the uh, baptistries at uh, Ravenna. 
And so here we have the Christ uh, in the Jordan River, uh, a nude figure uh, with the water here rising very, very high, way up to his chest, but translucent, transparent. Uh, John the Baptist is uh, reaching out to baptize him. Uh, angels wait him on one side, uh, other people, uh, presumably people waiting to be baptized uh, behind John. And then, of course, we see a trinity with the hand of God, uh, reaching down with rays going to Christ uh, and in the center is the dove of the Holy Spirit and of course the words that God said uh, it said that the Holy Spirit descended as a dove and the words were heard this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased so these are indicated in the uh, in the artwork um, you've seen images of the baptism of Christ before and of course these follow uh, the same types. Uh, you've seen them in, uh, you've seen images of the baptism of Christ before, such as uh, the Menologian of Basil II. And here you can see in the Daphne mosaic that many of the same iconographic types are being followed. Uh, you have Christ uh, suspended in the water, which is transparent, he's in the nude. Uh, and John the Baptist is leaning over to baptize him. Uh, behind John, there are figures of other people waiting to be baptized. And on the opposite side of the Jordan River, there are angels waiting to receive Christ. It looks like they're waiting to dry him off and to supply him with clothes. Uh, they are attendant angels. Uh, and then we see the Trinity, essentially. Uh, from the very top of both the mosaic and the manuscript illumination, there is the hand of God reaching down with rays of light descending. And so the Bible says that the Spirit of God descends like a dove. And so we see the dove of the Holy Spirit hovering between. And then of course uh, there are God's words, uh, this is my beloved Son in whom, in whom I am well pleased. One thing you may notice in the difference between the Menologian of Basil II, which is from what, uh, about 1000, uh, and the Daphne baptism, which is around 1100, so about 100 years different, is that the mosaic is more stylized. Uh, it's as though someone is copying uh, a model, which, you know, it's the same types in both cases, um, but when you're copying, uh, you become perhaps more stylized, more linear. Uh, and also mosaics, as we said, you can't shade a mosaic. You have to arrange the tesserae so that if you're far enough back, maybe the, the, uh, 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 the image looks shaded, which we saw at places like uh, Santa Maria Maggiore. However, uh, as time goes on, uh, the mosaic technique becomes much more linear, which is uh, what we're seeing here. But here you have the transfiguration of Christ uh, with rays of light beaming from Christ. And around him is a uh, mandorla or an almond-shaped body halo. So this is to show uh, his spirituality, that he is indeed transfigured. Uh, I was, when I was a child, I always wondered what transfigured meant, and I thought I'd grow up and I would know, and um, well, I'm still just looking at images and seeing how they're portrayed. Um, but on either side, we have Moses and Elijah, and in this case, uh, they are full-length figures. And then the three disciples, Peter, John, and James, uh, cower uh, before the, him. Uh, John is, is literally is cowering. Uh, Peter is uh, looking up, he's kneeling, he's gesturing. Uh, James is sort of, uh, has his hand up as though the, the brightness of this image might be uh, uh, hard on his, his eyes or his head. Um, in other words, it's something miraculous is happening, and they all are reacting to it. Uh, this one has a little bit more uh, setting. You have a, a suggestion of a landscape and a hill. Of course, this took place uh, on a hill. If you look at the detail, uh, you see how very linear the uh, arrangement of the tesserae is, so this gives us a feeling of abstraction and timelessness. The Daphne crucifixion. Uh, this is not in the pendentives. Uh, the Daphne crucifixion shows the suffering of Christ. 
Christ is hanging on the cross. And you'll notice here he's hanging down. Uh, his hands are nailed to the cross, but his arms arc down. And this is, I was going to say, this is a very elegant crucifixion. Uh, you have repeated curving forms as well as some of the angular forms. Um, his body sways to one side as though you know, he can't hold it up. It's uh, sagging. And then you see both the blood and the water coming from the wound. It's a perfect arc, a line of red and a line of white, tesserae. So, you know, it's both the body and blood. Christ is shown suffering, but there is emotional restraint. Uh, Mary stands erect under the cross, erect in faith. She gestures to Christ. We mentioned the idea of pointing to Christ as showing that he is the way to salvation. Uh, John uh, here he's not using the gesture of putting his hand to his cheek to show his suffering. His hand is up what, in wonder, uh, pointing to Christ, uh, you know, uh, uh, drawing our attention uh, toward the Savior. And once again, very linear images, but very, very elegant. Uh, you can see the decoration, for example, on Mary's uh, garment. and. Uh, these zigzags uh, that form the edge of her veil. When you look at this image, it is iconic, it is timeless, it invites devotion. You have the essential elements, the three main figures, Christ, Mary, and John. And as you can see, just above the cross, there's just a little bit of uh, two angels who, who were hovering there, but, we, uh, but the, the uh, tesserae had been lost. It is an elegant crucifixion uh, with these beautiful curving lines, uh, a real feel for both the positive and negative shapes. Negative shapes are the background shapes. The positive shapes are the shapes of the figures. Uh, which of course are created with outline. Uh, you create the feeling of uh, the drapery folds are also outline. And you might notice the beautiful decoration on Mary's garment and the little zigzag folds that mark uh, both the edge of her veil and um, the hem of her mantle that cascades down. Now, at the feet of Christ, we have just a little bit of landscape. We have a couple of plants uh, that uh, curve upward and uh, add to the elegance, and uh, a little bit of Mount Golgotha. And you'll notice that there is a skull at the bottom, and Christ's uh, blood seems to be dripping down uh, toward the skull. There are two explanations for the skull. One is that the place of Christ's crucifixion is called Golgotha, the place of the skull. The other is the legend of the true cross that tells us that Christ's crucifixion took place on the very spot that Adam was buried. Adam was the first human being. He was um, the parent to mankind. He is the sinner who brings, sin, Adam and Eve bring sin and death into the world. And it is because of the sin of Adam that Christ must come to save mankind. Human beings can't do it themselves. They aren't good enough. Uh, so Christ sacrifices himself to make up for all the sins of mankind and thereby uh, becomes a conduit for salvation of mankind. Uh, Paul calls Christ the new Adam who redeems the sin of the old Adam. So there you have the new Adam literally redeeming the sins of the old Adam, who is shown here as a skull, uh, the remains of his mortal flesh. Uh, and you know, so the whole drama of salvation is suggested, if you know the theology. And this is, once again, uh, the kind of image that you could uh, uh, pray before, you could uh, contemplate, you could think of some of the theological things that I've just suggested.